Okay, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today I'm continuing my conversations with Brother Jason Jack. Uh, we're working on our series, 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone. And we've made a lot of progress. Uh, today I, I believe we're on uh, number 79 on the list, right? Let me let me make sure I have that number right. It's uh, we're getting approaching, yeah, number seventy nine, and it's Romans eight eight. So we're about eighty percent through our list. Now, to any viewer, uh, if you have not uh, seen the previous videos on this playlist, I hope you'll go back and watch it from the beginning. Um, especially if you're someone that is um, not not holding to this doctrine that that salvation uh, comes by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone and we make no contribution for our salvation we don't do any religious works that contribute to the salvation the salvation is entirely a free gift from Jesus to all who believe and uh, if you if you agree with that then your uh, these these verses that we're discussing will help you uh, to you know reinforce that, and I hope you'll share this playlist with those people who don't agree, because they better agree. That's really what salvation is. If you don't agree with this, I sad to tell you, but uh, you're not going to go to heaven if you don't agree with this. This that's how essential this doctrine is. Okay, brother. Before we get started in the verses, uh, what's your thoughts for today I just hope we finish strong going into these last few videos I can't believe we're already 80% into this uh, seeing like just yesterday we started with Ephesians 2 8 and 9 and um, we are rapidly approaching the end we're gonna have to think of another project after this one mm. well I've got a, in my mind a list of things so I've got big plans for you <laughs> I really enjoy uh, working together. So, uh, uh, and if you think of something, uh, I certainly don't mind uh, uh, helping you if you're uh, if you decide to uh, do some of these on yourself. But for me, uh, uh, I've got uh, plenty of work uh, in mind for us that will probably cover several years or decades. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. <laughs> So the first verse today is Romans 8.8, 8, and it says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, this is the start of our eight verses into one of the um, my favorite chapters in all the Bible, Romans 8. And... When it speak, speaks of being in the flesh, it, speaking of being under the law, under the bondage of the law, um, trusting in yourself, trusting in um, your works, your efforts, not being carnally minded, being minded of the flesh and not of the spirit. Um, basically, the opposite of flesh is spirit. The opposite of grace is works. The opposite of law is faith. And um, Paul is making that distinction that the law, which was given to us, not that we can uphold it perfectly, but to show that we couldn't uphold it perfectly and to point us as the schoolmaster to Christ. He's saying right before this in Romans 8, 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. So Jesus Christ was sent into this world. God manifests in the flesh uh, like John 3, 16. But then it goes on in John 3, 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So Jesus came to save us, not condemn us. He came to condemn sin um which is in the flesh and in order for us to be in the spirit we must receive jesus christ um in who is 
in spirit and truth. We must worship in spirit and truth. And in order to do that, we must put our faith in Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins, according to scripture, was buried and rose again the third day, according to scripture. That is how you begin to walk in the spirit is first you must receive the Holy Spirit of promise through faith, through God's grace and not of our own efforts, not looking at the law and trying to fulfill it or keep it, um, you know, perfectly, but to realize we can't and trust in Jesus Christ who did fulfill it perfectly. Um, it says in verse four that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. So the law is perfect. And Jesus, it, you know, basically the law, the Old Testament are all the attributes of God, his perfectness, holiness, his righteousness, and to show us that we're not God. We're mortal, sinful flesh, just like this is talking about here. And in the flesh, we can't please God. Um, you know, and, and that reminds me of another verse. I won't go on that tangent, but, um, you know, we need to understand that we can't fulfill the law, but that we receive Jesus Christ who did fulfill the law. Therefore, the law and its righteousness is fulfilled in us because we have the spirit. So that's what Paul is um, discussing in this first part of Romans 8, a great chapter. Well, the, the list that we're uh, teaching off of and uh, commenting about uh, is a list that I discovered somewhere on YouTube or on, on, or on the internet. I don't know where I got it. I can't remember. But it's uh, the list was titled 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone. So I saved that list, and I, I haven't gone through the list and studied it all to see what was on it. I just thought, well, this would be a good list to, to study. So every time we come to a verse, it's always a surprise to me. I don't know what's coming next. I didn't prepare the list. But um, overall, I think this list has been fantastic. But there's every once in a while, we, a verse pops up, and this is the next one up. But I'm wondering, what for what reason did they add that verse to this list? Uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, relevant uh, to, uh, <laughs> to the proving that salvation is by faith alone. I don't. I don't see how this verse um, makes that case. However, the verse and the chapter and the book of Romans, of course, is one of the most important uh, books for for Christians in the in the whole Bible. Uh, I mean, all of Paul's letters and the Gospel of John. I would say that that's that's really the what we should be really focusing our attention on. But um, uh, as you said, uh, you, you like Romans chapter 8. It's one of your favorites. So I suggest everybody read that chapter in its entirety, but I will also caution you that a person can very easily get confused in Romans 8. Uh, maybe, maybe you can do on your own, brother, since you like to uh, uh, still... Um, you made a video today I was watching before we started about the book of Jonah. I'm anxious to get back to that and watch the rest of it after we're finished here. But... Uh, you're busy doing doing your own videos and producing, you know, the things that you're interested in, and maybe you'll be interested in uh, teaching the whole book of Romans. I mean, uh, the whole chapter eight of Romans, since you said that that's one of your favorite chapters. But getting back to this verse and this subject today, um, I would say the important thing to understand here uh, is so then. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, when I hear please God, what immediately comes to my mind, it, is it prompted by the Holy Spirit that gives me this? I don't know. Maybe this is just my own memories. I don't know if God's t telling Luke, tell him this. I, I'm not claiming that at all. But what I think of about pleasing God is the verse that says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So I would say the, first, the starting point uh, on this subject of pleasing God is uh, what does God require for us in order for us to please him? 
And it, the scripture says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's the starting point. We need faith before anything else. And uh, the faith, uh, it has to be very specific. It has to be uh, entirely on the person and finished work of Christ. The faith has to be uh, that you're believing in the claims of Jesus, that he is who he claimed to be, that he says he came down from heaven. He says that he is equal with the Father. The Father and here are one. He is God. He's claiming to be God. That's why they uh, convicted him. Uh, the, the Sanhedrin convicted him of blasphemy, claiming to be God. So believe that he is who he claimed to be. In fact, he says, if you do not believe I am he, you will die in your sins. Believe who he claimed to be. He is God. He is Savior. And believe uh, that he, what he did on that cross, his suffering and death on that cross, did accomplish what he sought out to do, and that was to pay for our sins. He said, do not think I came to be served, but rather to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. So he says the reason he came down from heaven and became a man was to give his life as a ransom, a, a payment made to set you and me free of condemnation and judgment and the second death. So that's, that's you believe who he is, what he's done for you, what he has accomplished for you, that he did in fact pay for all your sins, and now there's no sin problem between us and God. We're reconciled. Now we're free to have a relationship with God. The curtain in the temple was torn from top the bottom is opened up, and now we have access to the holies. The holies and others, we have access to God. We can have our relationship. Uh, and, and then, finally, we, we have faith in his promise, his promise that uh, he, he's going to give you eternal life in heaven. Uh, and if by, by believing in him, that's what he promises us. So um, that's why faith is the fundamental first I, I maybe you can think of a good term. The first, uh, the most important thing, the, the, the foundation of everything is this faith in the person and finished work of Christ uh, and his promises. Uh, so that's how we please God. Now, what is this talking about? Pleasing God. So let, let me get back to, okay, is assuming that you as a viewer here, You've put your faith completely in Jesus. You're relying completely on Jesus to give you eternal life. You're not trying to get to heaven by working your way up to heaven through your own religious efforts. Instead, you're relying on Christ, and you're resting in his promise and believing his promise that you're going to go to heaven because of him. Assuming that's already settled for you, then what other ways can we please God? And that's what I think this is talking about. Um, and... and, and uh, I would let me ask you since I've gone on and on. Can maybe you could tell us a little bit about that? That's my question to you, brother. Uh, once we put our faith in Jesus and we please God in that way, what is this referring to about pleasing God? Yeah, well, first of all, you read my mind by quoting Hebrews 11 6. That's where I was going to go and decided just to stay in context with Romans 8, you know, that you quoted, but without faith is possible to please Him for. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek them. And so we see there that those without faith, it's impossible to please God. And in Romans 8.8, 8, that those in the flesh cannot please God. And so you're starting to make that distinction uh, between being in the flesh, being carnally minded, looking at the law uh, as your master versus living in the spirit and walking in God's grace and looking forward at what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. And I think that leads into what you're talking about. Once we put our trust in Jesus Christ, then we should not have the knowledge of sin in the sense of looking back at the law and allowing the law to keep us in bondage meaning you know do this don't do that and try to keep all these commandments and all these laws 
the point of the law was never to do that in the first place. So once you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and receive the Holy Spirit, then live in the Spirit. Look forward at the cross. That Look forward at those things that you can do to be pleasing to Him. Get in the Word of God. Read your Bible. Read a lot of it as much as you can. That's the quickest way that you can mature as a Christian, as a babe in Christ. Um, develop a prayer life. Find others that believe in the true gospel of Jesus Christ so that you can be edified and and grow and and mature in your walk with Christ. You know, do those things and suddenly you're not thinking about the bondage of the law and those things because you're spiritually minded. You're looking forward. And so, you know, I think as Christians, we want to make sure that we don't allow ourselves or allow others such as pastors that will come in and say, you know, don't do this, 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 and this, and then add the subtle hint that if you do this, then that proves maybe you're not saved. That proves maybe you never received salvation or even the heresy that you could lose salvation. Um, and get people confused, get young Christians, especially who haven't been grounded and settled in the word of God, get them doubting their salvation, doubting their faith, you know, basically making their, their faith shipwrecked. But to live in the spirit, you gain assurance, you gain confidence. Like it says in verse six, the spiritually minded is life and peace. And because you've trusted in the gospel of peace, uh, you've trusted in the way, the truth, and the life, and you're doing those things. You're reading his word. Um, you're praying to him through the son. You're doing all these things. That's the way that I think that Romans 8 in context with these, you know, these passages should be viewed when we're looking at this as um, part of a discipleship. So uh, I would say then um, we both kind of made the same point in this. Uh, the thought came to our mind that, uh, well, we want to be in the spirit, not in the flesh. So how do you get in the spirit? <laughs> you can't get in the spirit unless the spirit is in you. So first, we have to believe on Jesus, be born again from above, as Jesus said, a spiritual new birth. Then the Holy Spirit is comes into us. That's called the baptism of the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit first enters, enters us, connects our spirit, quickens our spirit, brings us alive spiritually. And then the Holy Spirit then indwells us, lives in us. And while the Holy Spirit is living in us, for the rest of our lives, I'm assuming even into eternity, then uh, the Holy Spirit is prompting us, is trying to, uh, it also says in Warm, Mormons, Romans, uh, I said more Mormons, <laughs> in Romans, uh, it says, uh, do not be uh, conformed to, to this world, but be renewed by the, uh, your mind be renewed. I don't know, you have to quote, you have to tell me that one. But the, we want the, the Holy Spirit to transform our minds. And, and that happens when we uh, first understand the Holy Spirit is in there and trying to prompt us. Sometimes I, it's probably very subtle. I don't, I've don't. i met some people that said God audibly speaks to me, uh, but God's never audibly spoken to me. Uh, but I think he's communicating with me, but it's subtle. And we have to have our you know, hearing aids turned up, will actually be tuned in to try to listen to them, to be aware. And and, uh, and and when we get the sense that God is trying to direct us through the Holy Spirit guiding us and transforming us and changing our desires and our interests uh, and our thoughts, uh, that we, we can either embrace the promptings of the Spirit or we can resist the Spirit. And the Scripture says that... Uh, you know, we when we resist the spirit, we grieve the spirit. The spirit of God is grieved. That 
<laughs> they're trying to transform us into spiritual people, and we're resisting it, so the Spirit's grieved. Uh, but the Holy Spirit will never give up on you and say, oh, it's a waste of my time, I'm leaving. No, because the Bible says, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. So uh, it's a hermetically sealed body that we have here. The Holy Spirit is in us and will not never leave us. Uh, and so even when we grieve the Spirit, uh, the Spirit remains. Uh, now, the Scripture also says that we can... Um, um, uh, what is the word? Maybe you can help me with this. Beyond grieving, it is uh, quench. We can quench the spirit. And to me, quenching the spirit is when we reach the point, it's kind of like the concept of being a reprobate, where people all want to say they're reprobates, they're beyond hope. But I believe that when we resist the spirit so much that, that the Holy Spirit does not stop trying to transform us, but we've tuned him out so much we don't even hear it anymore. It's like we've built up calluses from resisting and resisting that we're, we don't, we're not even sensitive to the promptings of the Spirit anymore, and that the Spirit is quenched. Uh, so these are the, the ways that we can walk in the Spirit and live in the Spirit. Uh, first, we've got to get the Spirit, then we've got to listen, and then we've got to subject our will over to the will of God to allow the will of God to work in us and transform us instead of fighting it. And, and so in that way, I would say, then, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So when you're in the flesh, instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to transform you and guide you in your life, you're, well, then you're living in the flesh, and you're not pleasing God in that way. You're grieving the Holy Spirit, I would say. All right, I, I don't know if I'm, I got off on a kind of a tangent. What's your thoughts on that before we go to the next verse? Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that's what Paul says later on in Romans 12, too. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Um, and, you know, I, I, I just know where these are. I can't I don't memorize them. But I just kind of know where they are some most of the time, not all the time. So I can go to them. Um, but yeah, I think that's the perfect complement for Romans 8 in the discussion that we're having. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're here to find those verses so quickly for me because I I really like butchered that verse. Sorry, Lord. I was really <laughs> about that. But at least uh, they, they got it correctly in the end here. Um, all right. Should we go to the next one? Let's do it. Okay. The next verse on our list is uh, actually is uh, three verses, I guess. Romans uh, chapter 3, verse 23 through 25. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Doesn't get much clearer than that. You know, this is um, Romans 3.23, which we use to oftentimes begin soul winning, uh, showing somebody that we're all sinners and we need a savior, you know, so we need, need to acknowledge our sins and that we need a savior because we all fall short. Um, but then how do we how do we get this remission of sins? You know, we acknowledge our sins, but how, how do we get forgiveness of our sins now? Um, well, this verse tells you, this passage tells you very clearly uh, that it's through, it's by his grace that we're justified. Uh, like you said, just as if we hadn't sinned. Um, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So you must receive this redemption through Christ Jesus. You must be in Jesus Christ, and you have that through what? Faith. Um, and faith in his blood specifically here in Romans 3.25. But it's basically understanding that Jesus 
is God in the flesh who died for our sins. You know, his blood atonement paid the price for our sins so that we could be redeemed. Um, and so these words that have kept coming up over and over and over again in this series, you know, uh, redemption, propitiation, remission, uh, forbearance here, we see this, um, you know, we see all these right here in just these few verses together. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, those of us who uh, focus uh, so much on the ministry of evangelism, uh, which is telling people the good news that salvation is a free gift offered to everyone. Uh, when we when we make that our primary mission, um, we we focus a lot on the, the verses that that apply to that. And, and this, of course, is one of those great verses. I mean, all, this whole section, but particularly the first verse. Um, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, you know, I've, I can't tell you how many times I've cited this verse. I bet you in almost 800 videos now, uh, I bet you I've cited it several hundred times. Uh, so I might be repeating myself for those of you who watch a lot of my videos, but this verse is, is so important to understand. For all have sinned, that means all means uh, there's no exceptions. Uh, you could you could never tell me that you're you're a person that's never sinned. I've, I've only encountered a couple of people like that, by the way. And all my experience in in one-on-one uh, -on -one personal evangelism and in, uh, preaching to crowds and in, on YouTube, I've only encountered a couple of people that dared boast that they they never sinned. Not just, I'm not talking about the sinless perfection. You know, Christians that say once they got saved, they stopped sinning completely. Yeah, that's a different group. I'm talking about someone that's lost, but just claims they've never sinned. <laughs> but so that's rare. But for those people, this verse says all have sinned. And there are other verses that says no one is righteous, not even one. Jesus says, well, why do you call me good? No one is good but God. Only God is good. Only God is righteous. Oh, we've all sinned, everyone except for Jesus Christ. Uh, so that's the first thing that a person needs to understand that we are all guilty of sin and because of sin and it's not only our um, act overt acts of sin that we we clearly know that we're doing something wrong and people can observe and say hey that, you're definitely doing something wrong there you know, the uh, Bible says that's sin, but at least, you know, that's not right, what you're doing. So th there are things that people do that you know, everybody recognizes as, as sin or, or it's the wrong thing to do. Uh, and, and then there are other things that uh, uh, people sin, and they, but they don't realize they're sinning because they just have an angry thought or, or they have je some jealousy or, or, or they're uh, envious. And, uh, all these things are also sins of the heart. If Jesus wanted to make sure we understood, it's not just the, the way we act out; it's even our thoughts and our, our, the condition of our heart towards each other. Uh, and then he, there's also the sins of omission. In other words, uh, was there something good that you could have done today that you neglected to do? Someone needed some help from you, but you made some excuse, and you could very easily help them, someone in need. You know, uh, it's not that you're required to do it, but if you fail, that's a sin of omission. So, uh, when a person understands really what sin is, then anybody should be able to, even the most stubborn, prideful person, should be able to admit that this verse is true all have sinned. And when it says, come short of the glory of God, I've always compared that to Jesus Christ because I, you know, the Bible says that uh, all glory is for God. And the Bible says that God does not share his glory. But the Bible says that Jesus and the Father are sh sharing glory and Jesus gets glory. So uh, these, obviously, these are ways that we, through deductive logic, we conclude that, uh, well, 
Jesus has to be God because only God can share the glory of God. Uh, and uh, so I, I look at when it says that we all fall short of the glory of God is that it, it's a, a standard that was set that we think we may be able to reach through our, our human, uh, you know, uh, self-righteousness and, and egos. Uh, thinking maybe I can get good enough that I can work my way up to heaven, and and if this is the standard I've got, maybe I can reach that standard, and God will declare me acceptable. Uh, but the Bible says we all fall short of the glory. The glory of God is the standard. That's perfection. And I, I believe that Jesus, when he became a man, he he says he did it to be so that he could die. God cannot die, <laughs> so. What's he going to do? How's he going to die for our sins? He has to become a man in order to die. So that's part of the reason, Jesus. But he also said, I came to serve. Now, how did he serve? He performed miracles. He did all kinds of uh, wonderful works. But he also came to teach us and give set an example. He washed the feet of the apostles. And he said he was doing this as an example. He says, if I'm willing to do this, wash your feet, then you should certainly be willing to, you know, uh, humble yourselves and serve each other. And if you really want to be great, the apostles were arguing who could be the greatest in the kingdom. He says, if you want to be the greatest, become the least, become the uh, humble, become a servant. Uh, so he, he, uh, he became a man to set an example for us to follow. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, but the standard he set is perfect. So we all fall short of the standard that Jesus set, perfection. To me, that's how I, maybe I'm reading more into it than than's really there, I don't know. But that, that's how I, what I get out of that verse. Um, uh, I want to talk more about the other two verses here, but let me just pause because I went on and on on that verse. So any, any thoughts on that? Um. Yeah, you speak of like Jesus being the perfect example. And I think a lot of people use that wrongly, though. And the, and the way that I say and, the, and what I mean by this is like you see the bumper stickers. What would Jesus do and all these things? And Christians begin to think that what they're doing and how they are living in respect to how Christ lived is part of their salvation. And that's what a lot of these Lordship Salvationists will teach that you, yeah, you believe and, and that's fine, but you also have to make him Lord of your life. And to do that, you have to do his will and you have to follow his example and what would Christ do? And if you're not doing those things that Jesus would do or that he did in his ministry, then that's showing that you aren't, being led by the spirit, for instance, meaning that you may not have salvation because you are falling short of the glory of God. Um, but, you know, I just want to make sure that everyone knows that it's his righteousness that we're saved. That's how we receive salvation. It's not our righteousness, which we do. Um, it's by faith in Jesus Christ. And, you know, and that goes on in this passage. If you just read the next couple of verses, um, you know, after verse 25, it says in verse 26 to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him, which believeth in Jesus. Whereas boasting then it is excluded by what law of works, nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without deeds of the law. So that's the whole point of this study, this 101 verses, you know, is the conclusion here after this passage in Romans 3.28 that man in the sight of God is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, without our righteousness. Um, we should do those things that are pleasing to God and we should be led by his example and do those things. But that is part of discipleship. And so don't ever get mixed up in what salvation is about and what discipleship is about. You know, we should we should receive the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ 
then go on to use the Holy Spirit that works from the inside out to clean up our lives so that we can do those things that are pleasing to God, so that we can turn from things that we have been doing in the past and allow God's grace, his love to shape us and mold us as we grow in the spirit to do those things. But if we are looking at our flesh and trying to do those things ourselves and think that, well, I have to turn away from all this in order to receive the spirit, you're mixing up and muddying the gospel. That's not the gospel. We don't make ourselves well before going to the healing physician, Jesus Christ. We acknowledge our illness, which is sin, and then go to him and receive the healing elixir of eternal life through faith that is in him. We don't try to use our own placebos that are ever going to work, our works and our deeds that we think are so righteous and think that that's going to get us well. And then we merit the opportunity to receive eternal life. No, that's not how it works. We acknowledge we're a sinner, that it's not any of our righteousness. Then we go by faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ, except what he did on the cross for us, his free gift that he justifies us through faith. Then we go on to do those things. Um, but we can't do it without being in the spirit and we can't receive the spirit without resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ and not in our own efforts. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, well, you can never say it uh, too uh, often. Too long. Yeah, we're getting yeah, a little echo back, back, back there. You need to mute. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, well, your your point is is um, very important, and I, I, I certainly just sometimes we're preaching to the choir. Uh, you know, the people we, a lot of people watch our videos. They they believe and understand this as, as well as we do. Um, so, but but then there's many times, hopefully, even more important than the believers. I hope that unbelievers watch this, and that that's really what uh, what we're hoping for, and uh, that's the real primary purpose of doing this. So, in, with that in mind, it is important to always emphasize over and over again, we can never say it too much, that uh, the, the things that I was talking about, about uh, getting uh, Jesus set an example for us to, to do, well, yeah, his life is an example. Uh, and um, he, he did many things and he decided that, uh, hey, you should become a servant. But as you said, we should never think of those things as a uh, formula to gain salvation. You know, that salvation uh, is, is entirely a free gift we receive through our faith. Um, but so how, do this, how does the, uh, uh, this uh, example that Jesus set for us, um, uh, how does that fit into all of this? It goes back to the previous verse too, is, is about walking in the spirit or, or, or in the flesh that we were talking about before. I guess this is all just an another example of when we're in the spirit, when we're listening to the Holy Spirit, allowing to transform it, uh, the spirit to transform us, uh, uh, submitting to the Holy Spirit. I mean, these are things that only a believer can do because we, we're the only ones that have the Holy Spirit. But when we do that, uh, then uh, these things all kick into effect because these are things that we should do. And there's plenty of verses that we, we talk about. We don't shy away from uh, telling everybody that once we believe and we get saved, then we should get into ministry. Ministry just means service. We should start serving the Lord and serving our fellow man and serving uh, the body of Christ. We should start serving. Uh, but uh, that you call it discipleship. There's nothing wrong with using that word, uh, but um, we we should be doing those things. Uh, but we we're not required to do those things to get saved or to to retain our salvation. We should never fear that now that I'm saved, I've got to do these things or else I could lose it. No, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit into the day of redemption. You cannot lose your salvation, even if you fail in all these things we're talking about. Um, 
And you certainly don't have to do all of these things to prove to me or anybody else that you're one, you're truly saved because look at all the works I'm doing. No, that should never be a test of one's salvation, uh, judging how much works we do. Uh, uh, so, but this verse really is the purpose of this verse is the opposite of what I was saying. It is to tell us that we are sinners and we cannot reach this level. And that's, therefore, it's all leading you to the fact that now, now you're beginning to understand your need for a Savior. Uh, let me go on to the next verse here. Uh, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, well, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's something that we've repeated over and over again. You have already explained that for quite well. Now, I put the, the verse 25 up. I, I put this up in the Amplified because when I get to verse 25, I want to see what, how the Amplified phrase some of these things, and particularly the word forbearance, because you didn't have any problem with forbearance. And you must be more educated than me. <laughs> I, I just there are sometimes I come up against. Uh, I, mean, I, I come to a word that is old and very rarely used today. And I'm not really sure. And if that can happen with me, I am educated, by the way. I'm a college graduate, so at least I should know these things. But there are words that I'm not confident. I'm really getting it. So in those cases, I say, well, maybe a modern uh, translation would do it. Maybe it will help me. So I looked at it. And it says in the Amplified for that verse, it says, whom God displayed publicly before the eyes of the world as a life-giving sacrifice of atonement and reconciliation, that is propitiation, by his blood to be received through faith. Now, that's all, all those words that we're talking about that we've been kind of defining and re, uh, going over and over again in this study. Uh, you have all of these words here. I will tell you, I mentioned this, I think, in our last study. Uh, I, I suspect that there's many people who are just as I was misunderstanding the word atonement. And uh, I, I learned that I was wrong by uh, watching Aaron Budgen. And so I hope you'll all go to my, uh, the, the, the YouTubers that I'm recommending here on my homepage. Um, his is, uh, I think it's, New Covenant 777 or something. It's the last one on the list. But Aaron Budgen has a lot of great teachings, and, and he, he helped as well to understand things because growing up as a, a Jewish person and then tra training to be a rabbi, he has some insights on some of these things that I never had. And, and, and uh, so he shows me the, showed me the difference between propitiation and atonement. <laughs> I did the same thing last time. I don't tell you the difference because I'm teasing you. I want you to go watch this video. Um, but uh, so you've got all these words here that are important to understand. And but basically, they're all basically telling us that because of Jesus' shed blood on that cross, his shed blood, his suffering, his death served as a full payment for all of our sins. Um, that's the important thing for us to understand here, uh, that our sins are paid for. Uh, and then it says, this was to demonstrate his righteousness, which demands punishment for sin. But he took the punishment, and so we did, wouldn't have to. Because in his forbearance, now here's the, here's the word forbearance. That's the whole reason I, I wanted to see this. Because in his forbearance, that is, his deliberate restraint, so see, that's what I guess that's what forbearance means. His deliberate restraint, and that's that's helpful to me. But um, I, I I realize now that that's what it's referring to. And he passed over the sins previously committed. See now I, I didn't even uh, I did not even when I saw it in the King James and the way it was phrased. Let me see. It says. Uh, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now, when I'm seeing that, my first thought was sins that are passed, uh, so, so these lordshippers are going to say, see, he paid for your past sins.
But once you get saved, all your future sins, those aren't paid for. It's only your past sins. And, and see, that's, that's the problem that I saw in that verse. And so I'm saying, I wonder what this forbearance really means. And so this, according to the uh, Amplified Translation, they're teaching that it's re referencing the uh, uh, passed over the sins previously committed before Jesus' crucifixion. Not the sins. I uh, say I was born in 1950. <laughs> Nine, uh, over 1900 years after Jesus' crucifixion. So my sins didn't even factor into uh, th th this forbearance because he didn't have to forbear it before the crucifixion because I hadn't done anything yet. Uh, but all those people before the crucifixion, all their sins, uh, he, according to this, says he, he had deliberate restraint. He restrained himself from, from uh, giving these people uh, you know, what they had coming. He passed over the sins previously committed. Uh, so in that case, I find I found that the translation was real helpful to me. All right, brother. Any thoughts before we go on? Let me get it off mute here. Yeah, you know, I've always thought of forbearance kind of like mercy. Um, you know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So basically, the forbearance of God is not enforcing that penalty of sin, that wages of sin, the debt penalty that we should pay for the transgression of the law, you know, which is sin, that that's due us. Uh, it was due then before the cross, but he forbeared that. He didn't he gave them leniency. He gives us leniency. He refrains from enforcing that because of his mercy. And so I sort of look at that and equate that the same forbearance and mercy. Um, you know, forbearance is used in, in loans like student loans. You can forbear your loans. Um, and so it gives you basically a grace period or a mercy period, you know, and those, terms are are used um you know in the legal sense in that fashion but obviously um used in the sense of um how we receive eternal life and not receive what we should get for sin which is death you know those those are the wages of sins um but god forbears that and and it's through christ jesus Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, I guess the forbearance kind of makes me think of the, uh, the verse in, uh, I think it's First Peter, uh, where it says, uh, do not think Jesus is slack in his coming or his promises. Uh, uh, he, he's not slack, he's, he's long-suffering, not desiring that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, so the, the word long suffering uh, means patience. Uh, so I mean, when you're when you're really patient, sometimes I mean I don't know how patient you are naturally, brother. You seem like probably a really patient person. I imagine, especially in as a as a surgeon, it requires a lot of patience and steadiness without getting flustered. But uh, the other day, I was filing, trying to file my nails. And I couldn't hardly do it because it was it was the, the, and the act of filing my nail was so tedious. I, I like almost felt like screaming. I, I don't know. It's, I get more. I, I don't have the patience for something like that. It's just it's weird. I, I think there's something, maybe, maybe it's my medications or something. <laughs> but uh, I, I really feel like patience. I can really feel what happens. I was suffering. I didn't have the patience and I was suffering. So I can see how long suffering and patience it really can be the, the, the same the same thing that God is suffering with being patient with us. And that's what this is really actually alluding to, too, that God was patient with humanity and, and, and delaying uh, any any retribution against man because he knew that he would come to save mankind. Uh, all right, anything else before we go? Uh, by the way, 
Uh, I did the same thing as last time, brother. I didn't look at the clock. I have no idea how long we've been going. Uh, so if you know how long we've been going, tell me if we have time for another verse or not. I think we do have enough. I think we do have enough time. Okay. Yeah, we have time. One more. Okay. All right. Um, any thoughts uh, before we go move on, though? Uh, we can move on to the next one. Okay, so the next verse is James 2, 10, and 11. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Well, this is basically showing if we try to um, completely keep the law but fail one point, then the entirety of the law we're guilty of um, because we fall short of the perfectness of the law. Um, and then it goes on in the next verse, um, talking about the law, the Ten Commandments, but as we know, Jesus in the New Testament made that even harder not to keep. <laughs> um, you know, if if you say that you haven't committed adultery, well, have have you ever lusted upon looking upon um, another woman, you know, with lust in your heart, then you've committed adultery. You know, if you are mad at your brother, then you've committed murder. So, you know, the not only the the acts, but the the thoughts, the the you know, which can lead to the physical act of sin, even that in itself um, is offensive and in violation of the law and, and a sin. Um, so basically, you know, that's what it's showing. It's showing that we can't keep the whole law. Um, and, you know, you, in James 3, if you if you read James 3, 2, it says, For in many things we offend all. Uh, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. But the point of that is nobody's perfect, and therefore we can't completely bridle the whole body. And then it talks about how words are very harmful um, and can lead to a lot of problems in in someone's life if the tongue is not bridled. Uh, and many people just look at that verse and think about curse words, but it's talking about so much more than that. Um, and so that is the point of James 2.10 being in um, this list, you know, to sort of show the, the law and how we can't keep it. And if we try to keep it and stay under the law uh, without allowing it to be a schoolmaster, lead us to Christ, then we're going to be upheld to the law and we're going to be judged by our works. And that's the key. You know, if, if you allow the law to guide you in the sense that you're trying to keep it your entire life and be a servant and be in bondage, of the knowledge of sin, which is the law, and that's never gotten you to faith in Jesus Christ, realizing that you can't keep it, you know, for whatever prideful reason or self-righteous reason, you see the moral law. And this isn't just in the Bible. This is written in our heart. This is for every man, woman ever in the world. And if you can't see that you aren't perfect and you can't keep these and that you can never reach that perfection of gaining eternal life through your own efforts, if you never reach that point, then God's going to allow you to be judged by every law that you were trying to uphold and show that you could do your whole entire life. So how do we not do that? How, how are we not judged by our works uh, and by the deeds of the law? Well, we use that humble our hearts, acknowledge our sins, and that we can uphold the perfection of the law and turn to Jesus Christ, who what basically, you know, Jesus Christ, the Old Testament being the law, the New Testament is just 
Jesus. Jesus is the New Testament. He is God in the flesh and testifies of who God is that we can see. You know, you talked about Jesus being a servant, you know, and, and doing those things. We see those righteous attributes that we read in the law and that's on our hearts. We see it in the person of Jesus Christ fulfilled perfectly. Um, that's who we go to. You know, we can't fulfill it ourselves. We go to the person who did, and that is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, um, and receive his righteousness that he imputes upon our account through faith in him. Well, uh, these verses, especially the uh, first one, um, to 10, uh, is very, very popular uh, used in evangelism uh, to convict someone uh, so they understand their, their guilt and their, and, and their helpless situation. Uh, and, and then they will recognize their need to be saved. Uh, there's a, there's a, I think it's in Galatians. Um, I think Paul says something almost exactly the same thing. It's not the word for word, but the same point is made very well that you have to keep the whole law. And if, and if you, uh, if you fail at all, then, uh, you know, you're, you're a sinner. Um, but I think I like that one more. Um, but in this case, when, when James uses the example of uh, uh, adultery and killing, I don't know, these are, have you ever murdered anybody, brother? Well, maybe I shouldn't even ask you such personal things. And if you've murdered anybody, or, you know, or, or I don't want to ask you the next one, if you ever committed adultery, and it's too personal, I guess. But uh, uh, these are things that a lot of people could very easily say, I never did that. Of course, Jesus would say to you, you did murder someone in your heart when you hated them, when you were angry with them. You, you did have adultery when you had lustful thoughts for that woman, you know. <laughs> so Jesus there, doesn't give you any wiggle room out of it. Uh, but but for, the, for most people, they're going to say, well, I didn't commit adultery. I didn't commit murder. So maybe other examples of that, like lying or envy or je jealousy. These things are almost everybody can admit, yeah, I've, I've been envious sometimes or I've lost my temper. Or I wasn't patient enough. Or, um, you know, I was mean to somebody, said something mean, said, but the real serious things, a lot of times people be more objectionable. Well, no, I'm not that bad. But the, the point of this really is that, look, uh, if, if we were to really make a list of everything, not just in the Bible, but just even asking the person, okay, you don't want to talk about the Bible, let's establish your own code of ethics. Let's make a list of all the things you think are wrong that people should not do. And you start making that list and you'll find out that many people will put a lot of things on the list that we can find this in the Bible too. But uh, so if, if a person says, uh, here's like 20 things or 50 things that I think that is a standard, a code to live by that we should not be doing, these things are wrong. They're immoral, unjust, you know, all, inhumane, whatever, you know, you want to describe them. Most people would say, I don't, we should not be doing those things. Well, these verses are saying, even if you've done it all right, except you failed in just that one point, then you might as well be guilty of all of them. Because if you're guilty of even one, you're declared unrighteous. You're declared a sinner. You're declared guilty. How many how many types of sins do you have to break before you're considered a sinner? One. What's the number of sins you have to commit before you're declared a sinner? One. You know, I've preached a lot to people about, uh, hey, look, it's, you know, you think that someone else sins more than you? It's not the quantity of our sins. And, and, it, and you think that, well, yours, some other person's sins are more serious than yours. No, it's not the type of sins. It's just the fact that any sin at all, we're, our status is we're a sinner. And uh, it, 
it's there is a debate in the church and i'll tell you where i come out on this position but the, there's a debate are we guilty because of what we do or are we guilty because of what we are and i believe that we're guilty because of what we are we are born flawed we're born genetically uh, defective uh, that fall of man was a uh, you know a, a sickness that has been passed down for each generation we've inherited from our ancestors as, as a, a, a sin in nature you don't have to teach a child how to sin how old is a child before you catch them them you know trying to take something from another child you know being covetous and, and not wanting to share or, or lying every child tells a lie at some point when they're two or three or four they start lying you don't teach them how to do that we do that naturally it's in our genes it's just who we are so uh the question is are we unrighteous because of what we do or are we unrighteous because of what we are i don't know how you see that one but uh the point of this verse and anything of and all this little discussion is a person needs to understand they've got a problem they cannot solve uh, and the only solution is jesus jesus came to solve our unsolvable problem and that is that uh, uh we're guilty of sin all of us to varying degrees some sin more than others and you may say that other people's sins are worse than your sins but we're all guilty and there's no way we can wash it off and we can't get rid of it only the blood of jesus washes it off but god loves us so much that he was willing to become a man and suffer and die to cure your problem and mine all right brother in the parallel verse to james 2 10 i think you're thinking about is is in galatians um galatians 5 3 4 i testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law and then goes on christ has become of no effect unto you whosoever of you are justified by the law you're fallen from grace so you know paul's making that point in galatians the points made here in james 2 10 and we talked about um you know the rich young ruler coming to jesus and saying he has a held the law perfectly since his youth and jesus keeps pressing him basically to show him that he hadn't and he's not perfect and that he needs him um we saw that recently in matthew 5 20 where jesus is speaking to um the large gathering um on sermon on the mount and tells everyone that unless your righteousness exceeds the you know surpasses the pharisees or scribes that you will not inherit the kingdom of god and they're like this is impossible you know um and but that's that's the point you know jesus often spoke in impossibilities uh, you know he's he spoke to show that we couldn't do this and and that's what the law does you know he he says judge not that you be not judged but what he's really saying is you know you can't judge not therefore you're going to be judged uh you know that's what he's saying um and so people will twist those type of verses um and i want to do maybe a video about the impossibilities that jesus speaks to point others to him you know how he uses the law and the word of god as a schoolmaster um and some people get it and some people don't you know some people look at matthew 5 20 and try to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and pharisees and they will say well that rich young ruler he didn't give up all his possessions and followed him but look at me i'm following christ i'm a great disciple therefore that proves that i'm righteous and safe they don't get it you know they're looking at themselves um and and so out of all this i hope that you know those points are made through these bible verses that you know the the word of god is a is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart and there's so many verses that will discern the thoughts and intents of the heart 
like Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Lord, Lord, you know, have I not prophesied in thy name and cast out many devils and done many wonderful works? And Jesus says, you know, depart from me. Uh, you work of in iniquity. I never knew you. And then people will use that verse in order to preach that you got to work your way to heaven. And, and it's just spiritual blindness. And so um, in the same fashion, these, these verses like James 2.10, for instance, I've seen James 2.10 preached in a church that I grew up in that says, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. And that preacher will say, well, these other churches down the street, they don't believe that you have to be baptized to go to heaven. But we certainly see in Mark 16, 16, that that's the case. And in Acts 2, 38, that's the case. And there's no mention of New Testament musical instruments in the church. And anybody that has a piano in their church, they're not following the law. They're not following the commandments and the word of God in the Bible. We sing a cappella with songs and hymns and spiritual songs. And we're perfect and righteous and following the word of God to a T. And if they offend in those one point, just that one point of having a musical instrument, then they are guilty of all. And, and they completely don't get it. I mean, it's the blind leading the blind in those churches. And it would be funny if it wasn't so sad because I still have some family members that are going to those churches on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Uh, and so I think that's why I get a little bit fired up when I see verses like this and then see them twisted so much. I want to make sure people understand the truths of what the Bible, what the word of God is saying. And don't listen to these false prophets who twist the words to show how they're righteous and how you must be righteous in order to receive the promise of eternal life. They're missing the whole entire point. Um, so I'll let you go now. <laughs> well, that's all I wanted to say about that verse. Uh, so uh, if you think that we've uh, come near our hour mark, um, I, I suspect that we've gone over it, but I don't know. So uh, shall, shall you summarize and uh, summarize and close the, the talk? You're, you're muted. You're muted. Yeah, there you go. I got it. So we started in Romans 8 uh, and, and then went straight to Romans 3, which, you know, just, just read, read the book of Romans tonight um, or this week, whoever's watching this, um, see these verses used in context. Um, you know, incredible verses that um, Paul writes to the Romans. Um, you know, being justified freely, um, you know, by faith and it's not of our works. And that's the conclusion um, of Paul's letter at the end of Romans three. And then uh, I guess we just got to three verses tonight, um, but I think we covered them really well. The last one being James two ten and 11. We spoke briefly of the parallel verse in Galatians uh, three, um, you know, basically all of these passages are showing that we are guilty and that we have fallen short of the glory of God. Um, but instead of, you know, what some will try to do is teach that, well, now you have to right those wrongs and you have to repent of all your sins and give up drinking and smoking and all this stuff that you're doing that you're sinning. And then that's part of salvation. And oh, by the way, yeah, you believe in Jesus. Um, well, that's not how it works. It works the opposite. You acknowledge that you're a sinner and need a savior. You receive the free gift of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ, what he did for you, that he died on the cross and forgave your sins. He died for your sins, overcame death for you through his resurrection. Then, as we saw in Romans 8, um, you know, Galatia, at the end of Galatians 5, so perfect point on living in the spirit, then go on to good works, you know, which we should do. And we talked about that using those verses. Um, of showing how there's many times in the Bible where it will show, 
where we receive the free gift of eternal life through faith, by God's grace through faith, and that not of ourselves, it's not of works, it's the gift of God. But then we should go on unto good works, that those who believe in Jesus Christ were ordained that we should walk in them. We should do them. But it's not a requirement of salvation. So don't muddy the gospel. Don't let others muddy the gospel to mix what you do with what Christ did as part of salvation. Your efforts have nothing to do with it. It's all what he did. It's his grace, his mercy, his love for you, and you receive it through faith in him. Mm -hmm. Okay, brother. Uh, I guess that's it for tonight. Uh, thanks again for uh, joining me. I look forward to next time. And uh, to the viewers, um, as I said before, uh, we've done a lot of videos uh, to get up to this point, so they're all available on my YouTube channel, Sensei Preacher. I hope you'll watch this series from the beginning. Uh, thank you for watching. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.